Oh, that's a clap. There we go. Hi, everybody. There you go. I'm Barry Kostrensky. Um, this <laughs> is August 29th. Um, usually over the last, maybe it's been about six weeks, we've had speakers talk for 30 minutes and we've had some exciting speakers. Uh, everything is on the YouTube channel that you can find on my website and it's all under my name if you need to look it up. Uh, tonight we're going to do something a little different, something I've done in the past when I've hosted other talks on the organization. We're going to sort of randomly share. Um, uh, Audrey Anastasi is going to sort of start us off. Um, and then at the same time, we'll, we'll move to Michael Krasowitz and we'll look to open up a dialogue and a discussion um, on topics that I think uh, are present to us in the art world. Um, and if anybody would like to share, you could reach out through the chat um, or you, know, you can just jump in and say, yes, I'd like to share or anything and we'll make it happen. So again, thanks for coming. I'm gonna to move to Tuesdays in September and I'll sort of, when I have the calendar fleshed out, I'll put it on my website. So nice to see uh, many familiar faces. And Audrey, thank you. Thanks oh. for uh, putting something together. Oh, well, thank you. So I did put together a little um, thing. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Ah, there it is, I think. Okay. So um, everybody can hear me okay? Good. Okay. <laughs> So um, I sort of wanted to name it the Barry Show because it's got a lot of personality, but um, I just put in my favorite art talk session. So I'm just going to kind of go through things as quickly as possible, mostly by way of introduction. A few people on here know me fairly well, um, and uh, others just you know through these sessions. So. Um, I'm first and foremost, in terms of what's important to me, a practicing artist. Um, I'm a gallery co-founder, co-director, co-curator. My husband and I started Tabla Rasa Gallery in Sunset Park. I'm an arts advocate philanthropist. Philanthropist sounds like a highfalutin word, but it basically means that you work for the benefit of others. So I sit on the boards of a couple of uh, not-for-profits. And I consider myself an educator. Um, I have taught at various times, although um, often not formally. Um, so going into my practice, Barry knows this because we discussed it once before. Um, part of the way that I work is I try to foil my perfectionist tendencies. So in, in doing that, because uh, I, I can work very, very um, precisely. So. I discovered by using my non-dominant hand, my left hand when I'm working from life, I can get a character that interests me more. To, I use the word more soulful. Um, I work very, very quickly. I work against the, the clock. I use oversized brushes. And when I'm working on collages, I use broad swaths of torn paper and torn materials. So these are all ways to keep from kind of making everything a, a triple zero brush uh, perfectionist piece. So by way of illustrating that, um, this is on the right, um, a painting, uh, a small painting. I think it's about 16 inch, 16, 17 inch square um, done with my right hand. And um, on the left is a painting done from life in a few hours. Um, and the, the part you're seeing is I think 30 by 30. And there's also, it's a vertical diptych. Uh, the bottom of him is elsewhere, but I just use this by way of illustration. So as a practicing artist, one of the exciting things for me is right now, um, I have a project called Refugee and there's a show and a book um, associated with it. So this is a picture of the book, which is not yet published. Um, it's a limited edition book. It's not um, one that you would like find in Barnes and Nobles necessarily. So this is February 15th, 2020. If anybody can see the fine print, this show was due to open March 1st through September 1st. So this, this whole project got you know, totally foiled by COVID. So here I am signing 200 posters that like the next week, everything was shut down. So, um, mm. so I've had sort of a, a rough um, journey with this project. Um, 
this is an example of an eight foot painting uh, that's in the show. It's a combination of these eight foot paintings and some tiny paintings, which I will also show you. So there's 180 of these little works, also very, very spontaneously painted. And then there's four of these large panels, these eight foot high panels. Um, it's I'm, I'm sorry, if you just came on, maybe mute and sound. I'm gonna try and find out who that was. I think I got it. Okay, thank you. Um, so now the show is, is finally gonna open two years plus later. Um, and it, part of it is in the space that you just saw in the prior uh, slide, but we're also uh, gonna put uh, probably about 90 pieces in uh, the, the Library of Brooklyn College. And it's in partnership with the Valentine Museum of Art who has sponsored this whole thing. Valentine is a small private museum. Uh, so the pieces are all painted on these passport folios. Um, they're the size of an actual passport. They have a slick surface. And if you remember finger painting as a child, that's the kind of surface it is. And I did a series, it, it was a good kind of ironic base for people that are displaced for this, this uh, series called Refugee. So here's a couple of samples and you can see that the text kind of shows through and it's text about travel, but these are people that are not willingly displaced, but you know they must get up and leave to protect their families. So there's um, 180 of these. If anybody has a Jewish background, 18 is a symbol of life. And so I made it a multiple of 18. I made it 180. There's 90 verticals and 90 horizontals. So these are hordes um, uh, of people. Uh, um, one of the other themes, let me go down a different way. Um, fences, tents, um, people dying on the beaches. And these are from my head. These start, these are, fairly abstractly done. I, I put a glob of paint down on the uh, surface. And like I said, it moves around like finger painting material. And I would just kind of let it form from there. These are um, overladen boats. Um, and again, they, they have a vague reference to the pictures I've seen in newspapers and magazines and on television, but these are pretty much from a blob of paint that I just push around till it starts to look like something in the theme. So the other thing that I do in my practice is um, collage. And here's a pivotal piece that I was working on. It started as a painting from life, left-handed. And I tore shards of the New York Times kind of raining down upon this person. And you're not quite sure whether she's breaking out of a cocoon, protecting herself. Um, so it, it's vaguely narrative, but it's more suggestive than specific. Um, and that's the main part of my practice right now. The, the piece, the furthest on the left is a 25 by 19 inch collage on paper. And um, I kind of thought, you know what? I might like to translate this into something larger. So you can see it uh, coming out of the racks. The middle picture is the, uh, for scale, for size. And the, the one on the right is the finished piece from the same theme. And I, what I did was I did project the, the first image for the basic drawing so that I would, excuse me, Joseph, oh, that's very loud. Um, you know, so that I could um, have that as a basis. Um, the next one is the same kind of image, but this one was done from life. So the one on the left uh, is me starting to collage into the painting. And it's just a quickie little kind of thing. But what, what, what you can see is I'm putting the glue down and I'm putting these, these big shards of paper. So that's almost like using a broad brush. I'm not fussing with it. And then on the right is the piece finished. I think that's just going over and over again. 
at this point, I'll go down one. And this is just an idea for scale of, of what they look like. We stuck them up on the wall. But this also leads to the, the next part, which is being a gallerist. And this is the interior of Tabla Rasa Gallery. And when the walls are empty, I'll put my own work up just uh, you know to not have empty walls. And this is a show called About Face with a number of wonderful artists. Um, so you get a little idea. This was one called Nobis Solo. And this was one called Sanctuary. So we like to do thematic works. Um, the piece on the very left is by Janet Morgan and she's gonna be in the next project, which um, you might wanna take a screenshot for the information or I could uh, copy it from somewhere for you guys. But we're gonna be on a studio tour, um, but we're gonna present a show with the artists listed here. And then we're gonna have a number of events. So this is our first real show since COVID. And um, so it's a lot of artists that we like very much. I call it the real deal because um, the subtitle is Tabla Rasa celebrates talent and authenticity in art. So that's very important uh, when we're making our selections that the work feels authentic. And just by way of example, um, let's go to the next one. This is one of the artists we work with a lot by the name of Tom Bennett. Um, they're subjective, but they're also abstract. And this is an abstract artist. And he's uh, this person, Dimitri, is going to do a presentation called Hello Mussolini. So we've got some very fun uh, projects going. And that's kind of it. So that's me as an artist showing professionally and a gallerist. So there you go. I'm gonna stop screen sharing if I can figure out how to do it. Uh, well, I don't know how. Oh. <laughs> I'll exit. I'll... Oh. oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> you know, firsthand, it, it fits into a theme of the last six or seven talks where it's the artist who is the gallerist, who sometimes is a community player, who sometimes is involved on board and is doing a, a lot of different things. And they do feed and they do take away um, from your time as an artist. Um, but somehow I think it's like a richer, uh, a richer fruit when you have all those uh, different things going on. And, you know, Audrey, you get to see what it's like from the other side when artists come to you and speak to you. And it doesn't mean it owns your ability to talk to a gallerist. We have many sides to ourselves. They don't always communicate. So you maybe know how to act as a gallerist, but not when you're an artist approaching. It's, it's quite funny. Um, uh, can I open up to questions if anybody, I did not, I was not able to see the chat. I'm on my iPad. Anybody had any questions or comments even? Uh, yeah, the the i the chat is in a stupid place on your iPad, and then it covers up the screen. I've done these before. I don't know if you know where it is, but uh, so I did put on. I just I love those passport paintings. I just wanted to say, yeah, they were just so incredible and moving. Um, but I also I wanted to speak to what Barry was starting to address this sort of crossover you could talk a little bit more too about how each of the different things influences uh, your art making uh, when you're curating, um, running a gallery, doing your own work. How, how do you see the crossover and what it's doing, or I should say adding, maybe adding to your own work um, because it's almost in a way like having a constant critique, like having a constant discussion about art because you're always working with other artists. Um, so I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Well, um, I'll answer that. And Barry, again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so it helps and it doesn't help. So I, it's good to have multiple perspectives. Um, I don't share the fantasy that most artists have that somewhere out there, there's these rich people that money doesn't mean anything to and they do just the right thing and their career is gonna take off. Um, so Over I- Over my bubble. 
I mean, honestly, when artists talk to me, they ask me about the market, you know, and, and that's a whole nother discussion. Um, but for the most part, um, this, the bad news is no, I don't learn from what I know as a gallerist. So what I'm saying by that is I'm a little bit all over the place. I work in multitude of styles, multitude of subject matter, multitude of approaches, and that makes it hard for a curator or a gallerist to keep you in mind when an opportunity comes up, um, which means basically I'm not really branding myself in the way that is good business. That said, as an artist, I don't care. <laughs> I really, really just have to do what I have to do when the spirit hits me. And um, I'm not saying I wait for inspiration. You, there's something to the daily practice going in picking up a brush or, you know, tearing paper or just looking at old work when you don't know what you're doing because the act of working creates more of an act of working. So that's my practice. They're more me methodical people. And every now and then I do uh, something that might be considered more of a, a commission or a um, uh, an illustrative kind of thing and that you have to plan and you have to take a different approach but when it comes to my artistic expression I'm all over the place I haven't learned a thing <laughs> yes my bro um Audrey do you feel most liberated and able to just do anything when you're doing those collages the collages are very liberating, yes. And, um, so and again, you know, I, I put that slide in about working with my left hand. So when I work from life, I'm working with my left hand. If I'm doing something practical and teeny, it's, it's not like a, a, a trick that, you know, I'm do, you know, I put my glue down with my right hand. Um, you know, I'll, I might erase something with my right hand. But working with collage in the way that I do is a very liberating way to work. I tear big pieces of paper when I can, and I put them down like using a broad brush. Um, I don't approach collage in an illustrative way. Um, you see a lot of collages where people will switch out an eye for a different eye. And, and those, are, those can be really fascinating and engaging, but that's not it so much for me. It's all, it's all about like going wild and, working above my or beyond my tendency to make things perfect because I have that in me to keep fussing until I get something very exact but then it might not have as much life in it so mm -hmm. yes so now in, in these large collages in one of them I projected from a drawing I had already done but in the other I painted from life or in a couple of them I painted from life very large with big brushes, and then I worked into the collage. So um, that, that's actually a very good question, Monroe. Thank you. Audrey, if, if you had to create uh, like some kind of a simple narrative to kind of tie all your different art interests in, do you think you could come up with some kind of a kind of general kind of idea about what your interests are or what your direction is with your work? Uh, um, you know, that's, that's a really good homework assignment. Um, I, I hate, and, and again, you're, when you're advising people, you're not supposed to be very general about like your mission and your, and your artist statement. You're not supposed to say, oh, you know, I'm about the universal, la, la, la. But that's basically it. You know, I'm, I'm interested in the universals. I'm interested in, you know, what, uh, you know, of, of like the pain and the love and, and the attraction to beauty and, and, you know, all of those things are kind of underlying. Um, and I am, I am moved by social issues, but I'm not particularly illustrative. So this whole series of migration um, gave me an opportunity to address that in a more serious, direct way. But, you know, when I'm painting the women, I could go on for hours talking about that in terms of, you know, the, the social just salt, but um, th that's important to me too. And the feelings, the, the gaze, um, the solemnity behind, you know, the often, you know, beautiful exterior. Um, but 
I think that that would be a really good thing for me to address is what is unifying about all of it. it it's challenging. And, you know, I have it in my art as well. And I was going to say to you something similar that Michael uh, asked. And, uh, you know, it's funny. We do that as a group often. We sort of, as someone mentioned earlier, we think something and someone else phrases it. And that's, that's a very good thing. Think of it as an, an old, we're an old couple. You know, you can't remember something. And the spouse remembers we're, we're like a couple of 16, you know, all 60 plus. I mean, but it, it does work. There is this connectedness. Um, uh, Michael hit it, an important point. Uh, I, you know, the relationship I could say to my own art is I know I do so many different things, but over the years, I've tried to say, what's the commonality? And it, it is important sometimes as it is the pain, it's important to talk about you know, your work. And I would say, you know, I realized it's my brushstroke. It's like very simple throughout all my work in my doodles and my drawing, in my painting and abstract and everything. It's, it's certain movements. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't sound, you know, glorified. And yes, I try to achieve beauty. So I think you hit it when you hit the big words, you know, pain, love, beauty. And, you know, that's the thread and you can express it many different ways. And I like that you challenge yourself, you know, with using your left hand and trying to collage with large pieces. So I was thinking the same thing. You're trying to force yourself. Um, it's funny, the hardest thing is to change our repetitive paths of thought and process. Um, my history, I often stopped painting because didn't have studio or various things. Terrible thing, but then when you come back to painting, you forgot, you sort of get to start over <laughs> and you get to generate work you wouldn't be able to do. Um, so uh, an interesting thought. Any other uh, yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go out on, on a limb and say that you don't have to unite everything into a kind of uh, a series or a con uh, seek common elements. I'm at a point the same where uh, as you are where I don't pay any attention to that. I do what interests me. At some point, I may unite them into a series of paintings or the installation. If not, it's like a rambling sentence. I keep going. And um, I, I, I think that's instructive um, because I'm interested in a lot of things. And like you, I used to wear a lot of hats. I still do. And I just go with it. Uh, you may have to have, and I recognize this in my own work, individual statements uh, pertaining to individual bodies of work. And that's fine, you know, because you're not going to send it all to the same person anyway. Well, I think, I think Olga, when she said it's about the pain and the beauty and things like that, I think that's a very strong foundation for, what, for any, any of the uh, things that she works from. The other day there was this, this this guy on TikTok, and on every Friday he's like an art consultant or something, and he asks three questions. And the other day he said, um, "What is your work about?" You know, and you basically have 15 seconds when you respond on TikTok, right? So people, some people talked about their technique, some people talked about a specific project, whatever it happened to be. And you know, I got just from my, I said uh, something about that my work is meant to be some kind of. Uh, like a mystical trans transition, something or other. And one of the people that wrote back to me, it's just not my experience. He said, I'm intrigued, let me see your work. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting because it, you know, it's it's creating a set of parameters that it's, it, for me, this is an engagement with the audience. It's how can you kind of give the audience a kind of, uh, a, a, your, your passion, where, where are you going? Mm -hmm. and then whatever the work is, whatever the project is, it's, it's wide open. Well, and generally, that's what a, a statement is supposed to do, is kind of give some kind of direction. But you don't have to have it. If you're doing a lot of different things, I find for me, I don't want to have to stop and think of a statement, a universal statement. I don't believe in universals anyway. So, um, you know, why, why try to put everything in with a neat bow, you know, and then finalize everything. I mean, that, that's just my point. That's just me, though. But in essence, have that, a that, that becomes your statement. 
Yeah. And then your art gets to express all the different channels. Right. Right. But I was going to say the same thing. You can have your, uh, you mm -hmm. can have your, your uh, uh, ideas, but they manifest differently in your work. It's still right. the statement about what you're working on, mm -hmm. but the end result is these different bodies of work. Somehow they're tied by the statement, but not necessarily the medium. Uh, myself, you know, between sculpture, drawing. A painting I have like a multitude of things I work with so it's still the same ideas they're just manifesting well, themselves differently right it could be just a matter of process also it doesn't have to be necessarily um, a linear exploration of an idea I find you know I mean I, I I figured you know when somebody says they're all over the map you know there usually is a, a way that you could trace it trace several ideas but it's not a linear thing it's like more of a like a rhizome or something mm -hmm. um what i what i was going to say about my what i was going to say about statements is and then so now i'm putting on the educator hat and the gallery advisor hat um people ask about statements often and basically what i suggest is what would people ask you about the painting but you're not there so you're kind of answering that question so mm -hmm. people might say why do you work with uh, materials that uh, you know crumble over time or you know why are you focused on you know this particular subject matter or you know use a strange paint so um i think that's a way if you sort of imagine the questions or you know the questions people ask about your work um, that gives a very good um, guide to where to go to make an artist statement that's relevant and interesting and not, you know, just falling back on the, you know, oh, I love, you know, pretty, th you know, so uh, I, I'm pretty uh, adamant that that's like very important to try to do. And I totally agree with you, Olga. I have completely different statements for right. bodies of work. It, it wouldn't make sense to just mm -hmm. to just do one. Mm -hmm. I do well, that too. I do that too, but they tie to each other. But there are different statements for different bodies of work. Yeah. I think we can all admit to an artist, the word statement is a four letter word. For sure. Four letter word, guys. Uh, can you tell me what that word is, please? <laughs> like Valdemar, the word that shall not be named. <laughs> Well, By the way, uh, Michael, uh, I can hardly hear you. I don't know if anyone else is having that problem, uh, but it, it's difficult to hear your your uh, questions. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I will know. point out, I can see the chat. Jill, and I, I was wondering, Audrey, when you were showing your collage, because I've worked with Jill, she had a little collage group going that she'll start up again. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, uh, sure enough, she she popped on the chat and said, your work on Instagram is gorgeous. So finally capturing gaze and portraiture. I love the use of bright colors and expression. And as Bob said about the passport paintings, I just can't go without saying that. You know, it, it, you know, it can be great no matter how you draw, but if you can contextualize it and put it on a dollar bill, put it on a passport. I, I was visiting my uh, granddaughter on Sunday and you know, we had a nice drawing set and uh, uh, I didn't look for paper and I knew it. He had old New York Times. I opened the New York Times and she was like, I see she was like, I can draw on the photos. And that opened so much and it's just play, but you're playing on the New York Times and that's current news. You know, likewise, uh, some artists go ahead and they start coloring on photographs, sort of like, mm -hmm. no. And it's it's a brilliant open field, sort of layering what you do um, and how you do that is very important. Um, very, I, I'll add to that with the, my grandchildren. Um, we end up having, or I should say, I end up bringing a large package of clay. And we've all seen play dough. So, but this is clay. So I wet it just a little bit and I cut it into slivers 
and I flatten it out for them and I do exactly what you do, except I use color and I give it to them and I have them slap it on to the images. And of course, it immediately transposes the image to the clay. Stick it in the sun for a four or five minutes, it dries. And then we take watercolor and then they start coloring and painting on top of it. So it's a very interesting way to create an opportunity for a child to transpose something that's very rigid, printed, to something that's very loose, which is creative. So um, good point for you, Barry. I like what you did, and I just wanted to share that. I think we all remember the magic of Play-Doh when you could print. Right. <laughs> it, 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 right. it was magic. And it was like at age five or six that we saw right. it. Um, and I think as artists, we try and uh, you know, we create our own magic in our materials and our process. And sometimes we don't realize it, but when I get to see all you guys, I see the end result and how far you've come. You're all absorbed in it, you know, step by step. And, you know, maybe it's work going into the studio in all the bad ways, some of the good ways. But uh, I think I've always been impressed, impressed by the level of ability and technical skill, which, you know, I, I rank art and I try and figure out what's the important elements. And that's not that high up there, but it impresses me, you know, on a, on a deep level. You know, certainly with a Dura or a Rembrandt, those are critical elements. So maybe, you know, that is a part of it all, how you play with that uh, subtly. And that's, you know, sort of an old school ideal, idea. Um, yes. I was going to say, uh, Audrey, one of the things that you interested, your work interested me in was the idea of, of course, left hand versus right hand. I'm a left-handed person, but um, the idea of what you do, do you set any kind of time limit as to what you're going to do and it needs to be finished by any specific time? Or do you just let it go on and on and on and on and on? Um, so when I'm working from life, I will have somebody posing for a session that's Two, a long three. session would be four hours and right. I will cover a five foot tall painting five right. by four feet in that time. Right. Um, and I rarely work back into it. I mean, I could theoretically take a photograph if the hand wasn't right or something like that, but I pretty much try to get it all down there in that spontaneous time with direct observation. Right. Um, and uh, I mean, I have... I, I have bodies of work of paintings from life. Um, so yes, I, I, I do that. And then afterwards, now that I'm doing the collage work, I'm kind of embarking upon what I thought as a college student, when I heard about was like awful, which was a lot of students would say that they had a professor that would make a mark or something onto their you know, precious drawing that they had been working on like crazy. And in a way, that's what I do to myself. You know, I find a way to kind of break out of where I thought I was going. And Barry you know, kind of picked up on that in terms of like pushing myself. So I'll take a, a drawing, which might be you know, a beautiful life drawing. And then I'll just try to like transform it and make it, of, of a different kind of interest. I mean, there's some, there, it's great to have just a beautiful classic, you know, academic drawing, and that can be very engaging. But in terms of exciting myself, I like to kind of mess it up. Yeah, I, I hear and you completely. Claw my way out. I hear you know, you. I think this is a very interesting discussion. Are you, am I interrupting somebody? No, go ahead. Go ahead, Mom. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of interested in what Barry said about Rembrandt and Durer. And I certainly admire, as we all do, those people. But I find that I'm looking much more for something that's um, not perfect, but fully human. Right. And I tell myself fully, that. Sorry, you know, fully what? what can you do to this? What can you do to your artwork? to make it express more humanity, more joy, more love, more pain, more guilt, whatever it is you feel, you know, that, and that is what will really touch other people. 
because we're all these failing humans and looking for some way to reach out and to be touched. And that's what art does. It touches other people or it doesn't. And very often the perfect things are kind of locked behind glass. You can't really get at them and they can't get at you. So, so Monroe, can, can I add to that for one moment, please? Um, you all guys have great statements and I'm sure you do. Um, I have lots of different work that I do because I'm just falling into what you all do differently. I, I can't do the same thing over and over and over again, but yet it feels the same. So um, I have one line that I have used across all of my work. And it is very much what you just said, Monroe. It is the line is to reach the head, you must touch the heart. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what you do, because if you're going to deal with the cerebral aspect of something, then you're dealing just with the cerebral and you don't necessarily are gonna move somebody. Mm -hmm. But if you can touch someone from an emotional basis, then you've moved them completely into another mindset. Mm -hmm. And they're open for such a vast array of change of the work that you see and how they respond to it, that um, that's kind of what is the most important thing for me. Um, to try and explain to somebody, well, I've done this because I've done that, and this thing refers to that. You kind of lose people sometimes. But I think that if you could reach someone and explain to them in the simplest terms that it's about your emotional being and connecting with that piece of art, then that's a home run. That's me, anyhow. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to ask a question, and I think we've all sort of uh, uh, sort of hit on the answer uh, just by the conversation going. And it's a question I once saw a uh, collector who, to be honest, I didn't really respect collectors. And then after they spoke, I really respected what they thought. And uh, they asked the artist, what do you want the viewer to get out of your art? And it sounds so simple, but it was like mm -hmm. revolutionary for me to hear because it's a very different way to look at your art and think about your art. And of course, it's like elemental. I mean, we make images for people to see, to take in. What do we want them to take in? And you, you're hitting on it. Uh, humanity, uh, I think Monroe in, in a word is saying, feel the human beauty, not perfect with the human element. Um, and uh, uh, Audrey, you mentioned pain, love, and beauty. Again, all humanist elements. Uh, sometimes it could be the beauty of a Mondrian, not so human, uh, the rectilinear play. But this, don't put the brain down. The brain is an emotional right. thing, too. It's got the front, the back. You know, it's got the pituitary <laughs> is no little pit. You know, it's got a lot of stuff in there. Um, so it's complicated, Barry. Yeah, it's complicated. It has these neurons. There are like four of them that'll get smaller. They'll be free, and then we'll understand it. My first so, company I named Synapse. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, yes, and it's it's our relationship, the sort of stomach brain, the brain and the neural connections there, and the head brain, and we separate everything. I sort of think about light, you know, in the spectrum. What do we take in? You know, we all know we don't see microwave or ultraviolet but, you, you know, don't do we that take, we've taken 0.03 percent of the spectrum of light so obviously you know the light is like the big influence in photographers and painters it's heavenly light it's you know there's it, a lot there but we're not getting any light so in other words we have a very partial view of reality and i think all of us sort of explore and don't really know where we're going, but we're creating a new path. You know, maybe that sees outside that 0.03%. And we bring in something from outside the normal spectrum and love, caring. That's obviously, you know, maybe it is a wave and an energy lane, but it's just somehow not visible. It's something else. I think we try and bring that out. Michael, uh, some Sorry, thought. Uh, I think, yeah, I think um, there was this, uh, this rock and roll interviewer, again, I'm a big TikTok person, this young kid, and she was asking, she wrote down a series of questions that she tries not to ask, and then the questions she tries to ask. And, and she has certain signifiers, and I'm, I don't remember it exactly, but one, one thing she said was, don't use how. 
So if you're interviewing something, don't say, how did you write this song? Because basically, this is how I wrote the song. You know, and that is, it's, 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 there's only one answer. That, you know, the, then what do you do? You can't go anywhere. But she said, so take that same question and say, where did you get the inspiration to write the song? And then it opens up the view, the person to talk in, a, in an elaborate f way about all their inspirations. And how did that one riff come about? That came from, from the, the, the where, not from the how. And I think that, you know, so what I was going to talk about today was, I was going to talk about semiotics. You guys already probably know about semiotics, but I thought I did some research about it. And I thought it'd be interesting just as, as another way to articulate to our, to, to our audience in, in a kind of broad yet gen specific terms. We don't want to get caught. I, like, I always say, if I'm starting to talk about my process, I'm dead because I, I know I have nothing else and I, I, nothing that's not wrong to talk about, but, but I feel personally, if I start talking about process, I, I've, I've gone back because I don't know what else to talk about. And I go back and I'm saying, oh, I'm talking about process that, you know, it's like, it's like trying to describe an egg it's, or describe the smell of pepper. It's like, how do you do that? You know? So what I try to do is like, I'm looking for this uh, way to create a dialogue and to create this kind of like three-dimensional dialogue that can create um, a perception by the viewer so they can articulate to their friends what you're doing. So like Audrey has, you know, Audrey was a, is a perfect, the, the thing with the passports is a perfect example of semiotics. I mean, she's doing, she's using, she's using the, the different ideas of, they basically, they break it into icons, indexes, and symbols. And once those things kind of get combined, you start creating a mythology. And through all the icons, the icon of the, from the, you know, from the Holocaust, we create a certain mythology that becomes kind of universal. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna shut up in a second. But I just said today, Catherine. Um, her name, Catherine Bradford. You guys know who Catherine Bradford is. Mm -hmm. so Catherine Bradford talked on the Brooklyn Rail today, and you know she's really prolific, and a lot of her stuff is iconic. But she had this one. I'm gonna, if I can, Barry, can I share the screen just for a sec? Yes. Yes. Do so. Catherine does those sort of uh, neon colored. Uh, almost like the Pink Panther characters or, you know, pop she, culture. Yeah, um, she, but she's got, they, she talked about her whole career. It went through the whole thing. And uh, so there was this one image that she showed. It's got this, uh, you can see this um, uh, dock going into the water. And in the dock, she had a series of like purple and orange and yellow clouds. Okay. So everybody, I could, I'm sorry, I couldn't find that specific image, but people were starting to analyze her image as the image by itself and, and what she was talking about. And then she said, oh, you know what? You guys all know this image, right? And, and I, don't, I didn't know it. And then she said, I just took um, this image. This is a Man Ray image and I did my interpretation of it. She just, this was the same kind of clouds, but instead of having the pool table, she put a bridge to kind of personalize it. And I just thought uh, the, the point being is that she was creating this kind of iconography that she was referencing something from the past. But when the viewer was looking at it, because we didn't know that reference point, we were looking at it and analyzing it as something that she came up with purely from her imagination, which I think is just, you know, an interesting aside as to how we bring our own sense of, of semiotics to look at something and, and yet we don't know exactly where that it could be coming from a different direction so uh, uh does that make and if you can, if you have any questions about it i'd be happy to talk more about it i just uh saw this all came about because i want to do a set of TikTok videos where i'm going to teach young people how to talk about art that's my thing is i want to be able to take people who haven't gone and gotten their masters or whatever and, and don't really have the vocabulary I want to teach them a little bit about how I perceive the art what world talks about work and and that so that, that's kind of the, the focus I've been working on for the last couple of weeks is to try to figure out how I can. 
get them to understand, at least that, at, if they don't have to speak that way, they understand how the art world works so they can articulate to their friends in a, in a, in a more educated way and bring that vocabulary into the art and stay away from some of the pat pratfalls of, you know, trying to, you know, talk about things that maybe aren't necessarily relevant to the viewer immediately. They might later be really interested in the process, but at the beginning they're reacting to the image and the emotional connection that it creates, right? I don't know. Okay, shut up. No, Michael, I like your point a lot. Um, I, I'll add to that, the viewer can only do it from what he knows, that's his reference point. So the person who's looking at that only comes to it from what he knows. So uh, it's interesting to see that it was a Man Ray perspective uh, that she had found or wanted to find in her work. But me, as I looked at it, I had no idea that it was a Man Ray. So I'm coming at from exactly what you just said. I only know what I know. Her image. Yeah, and, and I think that, the, um, I think it's the onus is on us. I mean, I know that the, you're right, writing a statement is a pain in the ass, but it's it, the onus on, is on us to make that bridge, to, be, to bring the, the viewer, to give the viewer some kind of way that they can kind of connect with the work. Well, you know? so in finance or in most fields, you have your uh, elevator speech where you have to be able to summarize it real quickly. You're on an elevator, you know, real short what you do. Um, in books, there's like on the inside of the book, there's often more in the description of the book, there's a one sentence description of children's books I'm referring to. And it's sort of fascinating that they have to hone it down to that. And I, 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 I think your, your 15 second or 30 second speech doesn't, doesn't have to encapsulate everything. It should send arrows at the end, so to speak. And you can mention a few concepts, maybe general or very specific, and then, you know, lead to there's more somehow. Um, I don't think, but it is important. Uh, and I think, Michael, I'm guilty of what you say. I talk about my process, like, you know, I take the brush. You know, I'm very, uh, and because that's how I think um, when I create. It's weird. I mean, I, I try and uh, let go and tap into color and thoughts, but I really am, you know, it's like a dancer. You move your legs, you move your arms, you know. It was emotion. Um, well, I'm not a, saying, don't forget, I, I, could be I could be totally wrong, you know, just because, you know, it's just, you know, and, and I think that if, if the process is very important, it, it action painting is about the action. And without that, it doesn't the work may not resonate. I mean, you know, so so I think that there's no there's no rule to it. I just think that um, I'm, I'm trying to be better at thinking how the viewer comes at something. And then they're looking at an image, you know, they, they'll look at the brush stroke, but they're also looking at the image. And how does that, it's so different and radically different than what their normal perception is. They're coming at it, they're seeing the artist, like, what is that artist trying to tell me? What is he showing, he or she showing me? And how can I disseminate that information? And, and you know, I, I, as a cynic, I also think, how can the buyer tell his friends what it is that he just bought to a certain extent? So that, and that's, that's context to a great extent. It could be brushstroke, but it's, a con, it's as well as context. I think it's important what you're saying. If we, and if we dissect it, I can't really say so much, except that I know that when the viewer looks at the artwork, they right away, three seconds, two seconds, they know if they like it, respect it, love it. You know, it may take a few seconds more and there may be a lot of words and thoughts later, but I think it's a very quick reaction um, from I the viewer. I agree. It's instantaneous, Barry. I think so. Yeah, and I feel like the process, you know, that's part of it, but I feel like that's part of it from our point of view, more than from the viewer's perception of the work. So I think that's why maybe Michael doesn't want to get caught up in talking process, because that's not really what we want the 
and less like you're saying in an action painting it's all about that spontaneity of process and we want the process to be what the viewer is is taking away but typically speaking we probably want the viewer to feel the totality the impact of the piece um without a real conscious awareness of the process, you know, unless that's what the piece is about. Yes, Laurie. We lost, oh, there you I, are, Beverly. Okay, I, I also think it depends on the type of work you do because um, it should go hand in hand. I think the concept and the reason that you create art is, as important to, in my work, as important as technique. And often when people look at my work, they are interested in like, how did you do that? Because my work deals with um, inventing different processes. So although I have a message in my work, it's also a, a question of how is that done? So, you know, that is important to me in my work. And it does get communicated pretty often when I talk about my work. Yeah, but your well, work is very, very unique, Laurie. Well, now, that's what the, what my work is unique in some way, but mine in terms of process or technique is, is important. Laurie, show somebody a uh, piece of your, your work so everybody understands what you do. <laughs> uh, so show a picture. Well, I'll, date, I'll date myself, but up on the barrel, rookie. Who remembers that beer commercial? Up on the barrel, rookie. It's like it's like we're throwing 1968, and uh, he had to sing "Schaefer is the one beer to have." Oh, it was like sh shaming a beer distributor. That's Americana at the heart. I, I, I want to like, make a point. I want to make a point about what Lori's talking about. Yeah. Instead of in the barrel, uh, it, the the thing of it is, is that I, I get where Lori's coming from because a lot of my work is also about the process and inventing processes, working, discovering uh, new things while you're coming up with different ways to uh, make something uh, and putting together unique, <laughs> different. Uh, either found objects or made objects, but the whole, the process is as much, it's, it's, it's just as important as the, the statement and what it is that you're trying to say. So at least I think that's where Lori's coming from, right? That's exactly what I'm saying. Um, you know, you want, I'm sitting here, I'm sculpting a photo right now. And it's sort of important to me that I figured out how to do that. Um, will this have a whole different concept or content when I do a finished piece with it? Yes, but it was also getting to a point where I can do or accomplish this was really important to me. And if somebody sees this, they're gonna say, how did you do that? And that's what comes out when people usually see my work or I explain it. So, well, you yeah. know, it was one of the things that I remember when I when I had just entered art school and how I was so fascinated. I, I remember walking into some gallery in a show and I could not figure out how the hell that artist created that piece. And that fascinated me. The whole idea that you invented uh, some way that you could not tell how he did the layers and achieve the end product of these incredible, beautiful pieces that were all layered up and you could see all these things through it, but how did he do it? I could not figure out how he did it. And one of the things that people come up to me, for example, in my shows and the stain paintings, they have no idea how I made them. They can't figure out what I did. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like because I was so intrigued um, that I wanted to go figure out myself how can I make something that people can't figure out how I did that. Lori, please show a picture of your work. 
I I'm actually doing this on my phone, and unless I go into my studio, take a walk really quickly. But um, you know what, Lori? Maybe we'll we'll talk, and maybe we'll do a presentation uh, coming up in September or October. Okay, <laughs> that'd be better. Okay. Well, we I, I just, more than more than five seconds to prepare. I just <laughs> I just took a peek at your Instagram page to refresh my memory, and so you know. If somebody's got a, a different device, they can always do that. Okay. Well, th thanks, everybody. Thanks for sort of, uh, this had a different flavor. You know, a lot of us contributed <laughs> ideas and thoughts and we shared. And you know, that's how we sort of, uh, I got to say one thing. When I was younger in college in art history classes, I, I, I would like say the dumbest things in class. And that's how I learned. Because then it would be explained to me. And then I was like, oh, yeah, that's not it. And you know, it, it, it's sort of a, a good way. And I'm not saying I'm saying dumb things now, hopefully not, but we learn through interaction, through communication. Uh, I think I've, you know, I try and always summarize what is, uh, you know, in physics, you want that unified theory of everything. You know, you, you like in painting, you know, that one stroke that does it all. Um, and I think connectedness is the principle of the universe. That's, that's our thing. And everything from Monroe talking about humanity, that's sort of under connectedness. You're showing we're human, we're thoughtful, we're caring. And uh, I think when we're, it sounds silly when you pick up the phone and you talk to someone, that is something quite large. It is a miracle in the 16th century. If anybody ever you know, saw you do that, that would be magic. Um, we have a lot of magic at our hands and we forget you know, the fact that I'm alive that is magic, and that is a not a billion to one shot. That's you know a Google log, you know one with a hundred zeros. That's how unlikely all these moments are. We sort of got to savor them as as an artist. We try and make them. We try and make things. I mean, it is so basic, but I, I think there's something you know, out of our society. People are on computers. They're not physical. I once had a factory, and workers really worked hard and made things. There was something beautiful in that. It's very hard work, mind you, and people choose to work, you know, intellectual, intellectually with their brains. Um, but there's something to us as artists bending, as Laurie said, a photograph coming up. We're setting up problems and solutions. My paintings are riddled with problems, and I sort of work them, evolve them, and sometimes I'm done when I'm done with all those problems. I, I can't resolve them. So maybe it's not all resolved. Um, but we, we don't creators um, and there's the chat the challenge uh for myself just speaking for myself is that when i create these things and then i figure out how the hell am i going to create them how the hell am i going to make it work as a sculptural when you're working with 3d too and how do you put the thing together and then you have to create these new ways of how you're going to put it together and make sure it will hold and uh, no one's going to knock it over when they come into the show or and I'm getting ready for a solo installation and I'm in the midst of all that. And I and I think to myself, why did I why did I make this so difficult? Why do I do that? It's like but, the but, but look at the choices. Look at the game you're involved in. The game is, you know, engineering thought. How are people going to see? How is it arranged? Right. Those are good games. Unfortunately, other people are playing games like, oh, do I kill the person across the street? They're in war. You know, there's some terrible games. So as artists, I think we make a good game theory for people. <laughs> yes. Uh, so yes. They, That's they, great. A, 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 absolutely. It is. It's it's like you're setting up all these challenges for yourself. Artists come up with all their own ideas you go forward i do it in the form of i make these studies i have this crazy idea i want to do this and I'm like, well is this going to work well i think it's going to work and then you go forth and you try to figure out how to make it work you know and i think we hit on a point earlier that you know i'm sort of em emphasizing connectedness and communication but we don't know what's on the other end of that telephone we don't know when somebody looks at a work of art what they're seeing and that's sort of fascinating in a way. Um, and I'll tell you, your artwork touches people a lot more than you know, when it's, you know, out of the closet, so to speak. 
<laughs> closeted artwork doesn't suit too much. Um, so, you know, very much, dating. very much so, Barry, very much so. Yeah. I, I can't believe some of the reactions that I get when people see my work and how they come up and they say things and go, oh, that's interesting. Okay. You put it out there. You may have certain intentions, but you you can only control you. <laughs> uh, I will say Babs has a show coming up at uh, Hudson Valley Center. Yeah. For yes, I... Um, yeah, and Elisa's going to be in that show, too. It's a group show up at the Hudson Valley Mocha uh, um, in Peekskill. Back. Yeah, it's the reception is September 17th, and I will be there. Um, and it's, 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 in fact, it's opening September 1st. It's up already. Um, so it's coming up. But that's when the reception is. And then I have a solo show coming up in October, uh, which is not up there in New York way, which is in Tampa. Um, and uh, I, I was going to quickly share the one, the, the study, the, just the drawing for the show that I'm solo show I'm working on. But we're over time. So. And Babs, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out to you for a slot, say September or October. We're going to be switching to Tuesdays, everybody. <laughs> Uh, Laurie, you right. want to say yes. quickly? What was that? Did you want to say something really quickly? I, I saw you before. I, I know my phone is dying, but I'm going to say something to Babs quickly. Um, I think as sculptors, uh, uh, something similar between both of our works, um, I think some of this is self inflicted, um, challenging ourselves. And when I go and I start something, I think, well, why can't I just like put up a canvas and just paint or do something that's already where I don't have to reinvent the wheel. But it just seems that every time I go into something, that's my challenge and that's how I work. So yeah, I have, I have an MFA in painting. Okay, and I have a painting background too. So hey everybody. Gotta okay, go. go. I think we'll end it here. Thank you everybody. All right, thank, thank you. you. Roll okay. the ideas from everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Great.